So let me first of all introduce our clinic because everybody struggles with the name anti-fragility. So the typical health journey starts from what we call vitality. You know, when we're young children, we all have vitality and performance. And then this is where most people are. They have normal health. And normal health for us will be when all your biomarkers are green, and I'm going to explain that. Then we have distress when your biomarkers begin to turn yellow, and then disorder, and then you die. Okay? When your biomarkers are red. Okay? So that's normally the spectrum of health. So everybody in this room is somewhere in that spectrum. Everyone. Um, but most people don't have vitality. Most people are really bored with their lives. So I'm going to start. I asked my staff this morning, what is vitality? Kim, what do you think vitality is? I, actually, that's very good. What do you think, sir? What's your husband's name? Kenny. Name Kenny. Kenny. So, Kenny, what do you think about what, vit is, what is vitality? Um, just like she said, it's a type of energy. Yeah. So and, and do you know anybody who has vitality? I do. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, mostly I think that it's little kids who have vitality. Yeah, yeah most yeah most grown ups don't. Well, not just hyper. They they, they in, in French they call it uh, joie de vivre. Joie de vivre. Actually, this this sentence best describes vitality. And vitality, at its core definition, is a joy to be alive. You understand? That's really at the core of vitality really happy to be alive. You know like little children, you put them in a field somewhere, they just start running, right? They're mind, mindless about whether they're going to fall, they're going to hurt themselves. That's really what vitality is. So it's different from being healthy or what we would call normal, okay? So as we age, this is what happens. We move towards death normally. That's what happens as we age on top of what we call environmental and lifestyle choices. So normally, if you stand still, that means if you don't do anything and you just do normal life, you move towards that and die. That's what normally happens. But the challenge of life is to fight against this current. So from the day you are born, you start fighting against this current that takes you towards death in terms of how your body is going to, you know? Most of us want to die quietly in our sleep without being sick. So you can still die here. All your organs are working, but you just, your time just expired. Because as we know, and I know this is something many people don't know, every cell in our body has a clock, right? So from the day you're born, every cell in your body that's reproducing has a clock. And each of those cells, they, it's a new discovery, and they won a Nobel Prize on it, and that clock runs out and the cells all die. So when people who were do aging, 
they preserve their body parts and they cry you know cryogenics right they freeze it in nitrogen minus 272 and they awaken the cells and this counter on the cells continue so from the day we are born it's already predicted when our cells are gonna die is that clear everybody is clear about that right okay so the question is how do we die without suffering so that's why everybody talks about a healthy and long life. So the question is, why do most people not live a healthy long life? So if you look at the statistics, almost 80 to 90% of Americans, when they die, they have significant disorders. And as we all know today, most people by the time they're 40, 50, 60, already have two or three chronic illnesses. So the question is, why do you think that is? Okay. So we want to talk about some of that today. So what is it about lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, but what is it about the lifestyle that's making us sick? So, where, how did you develop? Are we all in agreement that it's lifestyle? So, are you in agreement? So, can I want to ask you a question because you're the only person who's not been here before. How did you arrive at your lifestyle choices? So I'll, t I'll show you what the lifestyle factors are, and then you tell us how you arrive at them. So there are seven of them. Number one is nutrition. Number two is nutrients. Number three is sleep. Number four is stress. Number five is hydration. Number six is toxicity. And number seven is exercise. exercise. Okay? So these are the seven things that define your lifestyle. How did you decide what are the things that you're going to eat? Kenny, I'm looking at you. That's a very good po answer. Yes. An astray from your mother or your grandmother yes. or your wife who decides what you're going to eat, right? Yes. <laughs> right. So it, it's normally cultural, right? And so, but when you move from Korea to America, it becomes a challenge, right? Because now you start mixing the culture with other things that you're finding in this culture. So you become a Korean American. And so that affects your eating style. So what about nutrients? So nutrients are micronutrients. I know you might not know that. Well, perhaps she has educated you. Kim, so how did you decide how to get your micronutrients? Yeah, we trained her to take supplements. But before that, how were you getting your nutrients? From food, that's how I Okay, so most people will tend to get their nutrients from nutrition. So what is the difference between nutrition and nutrients? You should know the answer, Kim. Okay, so, so, all right, so, so, no, no, I understand that, but why are they different? So, one of them we call macronutrients, and the other one we call micronutrients. So, why are they different? To give you 
give energy or food to the cells. Okay, he's close to it. So macronutrients, their two purpose is for calories plus nutrients that come from plants and animals, phytonutrients. Okay? All right? So we need calorie for energy. So the micronutrients is not for energy. It supports the nutrients that typically may be lacking from the environment or our bodies or the food that we eat. Okay? So that's why you need both macro and micronutrients. When we all lived in the village where the earth was good and we eat fresh every day from the farm, we get the macro and the micronutrients. Okay? Are we clear? So, but we haven't answered the central question. How did we come to decide how we eat? So we say it's cultural. But in America, mostly, no, it's really what people like. It's based on, <laughs> it's based on taste. Taste is number one, isn't it? In American culture, you eat what you like. You don't eat what you need. So that's how people develop their eating patterns. No, that's not true. In the old cultures, you didn't eat what you like. You eat certain foods like fur or this because that was nutritious to you. You didn't eat it because you like it. Yeah. Do you understand? I'm not talking about city people. I'm talking about people who live in villages, who eat properly, right? Because most city people have never learned to eat properly because they've learned to eat what they like. They've gone for taste rather than what is good for them. My grandmother didn't ask what you like. My grandmother just cooked. Come in. Hi, Chanel. Oops, careful. <laughs> oh, yes. Can you open the outside door? Thank you. Sorry, Chanel. Yeah, we always make that mistake. I didn't know they locked it already. I thought they locked it at 6. No, no, he's changed the time. Oh, people, oh, they didn't follow the clock changing. Oh, yeah. It's not supposed to be locked yet. Okay? So we're just talking by nutrition. So most people eat based on the taste they like, and they start training their kids from very young. If the child doesn't like the taste, then they look for something that the child likes, and that's where bad nutrition begins. We start feeding people what they like, rather than what they need, right? So that's why even with our supplements, you're gonna find out that a lot of the challenge is to try and make them taste good. Because if it doesn't taste good, most people will not eat it because most of our culture's eating is based on taste. That's why a lot of people don't like vegetables, like Kim just said, because of the taste, right? How many people here like broccoli? Yeah, but, but most people naturally would not be, I like broccoli, right? <laughs> how many people like onions? I don't like onions. Yeah, you see. How many, yes. how many people, you see? How many people like tomatoes? I don't like tomatoes. Hmm. No. How many people like eggplants? I don't like eggplants. You, you see? You see? It's about liking, right? Do you see the point? All those foods I'm calling are really fundamentally nutrient foods that are required. How many people like cabbage? You see some hands are up, some hands are down. How many people eat different colors of cabbages? How many people know there's different colors of cabbages? <laughs> well, you see, America, yeah, really? really? <laughs> How many people know what we call Dark plants, plants that grow in the dark. Who knows any example of a plant that grows in the dark? Hello, Americans. I knew that. Tomatoes grow in the dark. Pepper grow in the dark. 
Those plants that grow in the dark are really not very good for you. They are inflammatory. I know you didn't know that because you didn't grow up in the village, right? So the plants that do not require sunlight are not good for you. They don't have the energy that is required. So I, I just, I, I'm talking about nutrition as we talk about lifestyle so that we begin to understand where the problems come from. That if you are eating the things that you like, most definitely you're not getting all the full micronutrients. And that's why supplements are very, very important. And so a lot of people are like, why do I need to take supplements? Because the body needs them. And for the people who don't have it, we have a list here. Kim, you have this already. So these are the micronutrients. Right? So if you begin to go through these micronutrients, let's take one of them, vitamins. So there are very there are three kinds of things under micronutrients or two. Uh, we have vitamins and then we have minerals and we have some other things. Anyway, so let's stay on page one. So you know those things that are how many people here like cauliflower? How many people like do you understand? Asparagus. Asparagus? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, how often do you eat it? How often do you eat it? How often do you eat cauliflower? Or avocados? Well, I eat every day. You don't like it? No, I love it. Oh. Okay, but so let's just stay with asparagus and avocado and beans and all of that. Folic acid. Folic acid is one of the real critical micronutrients in life. And most people don't have enough. When we do the testing, most people don't have enough. And because, you know, if you go to the village, they are eating most of this stuff every day. Beans, how many people eat beans every day? When they went to Okinawa, the women in Okinawa, they eat beans every day. Yes, the Japanese eat beans every day. It's a critical part of your diet because of the folate acid, right? Most Americans don't like to eat be, uh, 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 beans every day. So let's go down. Let's look at ripoflavin or thiamine. Wait, I want to go back on the folic, the, the folic acid. Orange juice. Yeah, but... It, but it's contradicting... No, no, no. Well, our orange juice here doesn't have the, the level of folic acid that's required because of the soil and the way it's planted. Oh. It doesn't contradict anything. You were going to talk about the sugar. Yes, I would yes, talk about that. But sugar. if you add one orange every day, that's really fine. That's not a problem, right? Because if you're eating one avocado every day is fine, right? Or a couple of, but eating beans every day is very good for you, okay? So the, so the challenge we have, and I think that she just highlighted it, is that when we eat sugar, we eat too much of it. And it's almost in everything. That's what I found out recently about Korean food. I had not paid attention that most of the side dishes had sugar. I, I, I just hadn't paid attention. I thought Korean cooking was really pure. And then I find out that. And then, shock by shock, pho also has sugar. You're already addicted. I, I know to the taste, yes, right? Are you getting that? And so... And why am I showing you these uh, micronutrients? Because a lot of people who are not taking supplements think that they're already getting enough nutrients because they're eating well, right? But they don't realize. And if you walk through this thing, you find out that beans is the most populated superfood when you go through all of these lists. 
That's why the Japanese love beans. And when you also go to the Mediterranean, the hummus, right? That's why they eat a lot of hummus. It's made from uh, the uh, uh, fava beans. Yes, right? No, hummus is garbanzo beans. Yes, garbanzo beans. beans. Yes, okay. So they make it from beans, right? Because we eat it too. In Africa, we eat a lot of beans. Actually, my grandmother almost cooked it every day because it's actually also the best source of protein from plants without eating a lot of animal. And I used to think because we were poor, that's why we didn't eat a lot of animals, food, like, I mean, uh, like pig or like pork or like uh, beef and all of that. But those older cultures knew that those things had a lot of poison, right? Because like human beings, the animals also carry a lot of toxicity. And so when you eat meat, you're actually taking on that toxicity that is already in the animal. That's why seafood is actually better because the animals that live in the sea already have expressed their toxicity into the sea. We are all water animals, but when we came on land, we became very acidic and very toxic. That's why we need to drink a lot of water. Okay, is this making sense? So let's go to the next one, sleep. I'm just going to run over this, then I'll go to the main agenda of what we're going to talk about today. So, sorry, let me go back to nutrition and then just finish there. I'll just mention two things. So, the key issues around nutrition is around calorie restriction. Of when you eat so those are the two big things that we need to understand that in mac in nutrition or macronutrition the older you get the less calories you must consume because your metabolism is slowing down it doesn't matter how well you take stem cells or whatever your metabolism is slowing down and so uh, as I already share here for a guy who at 20 takes 2,000 calories, at 40 he should be taking 1,000 calories, at 60 he should be taking 500, and at 80 he should be eating 250 calories a day. That's what Buddhists pre prescribe. And that's what all the new research is pointing to, that a low calorie nutrition plan is the best for you to prevent illnesses. And if you notice, that's what the monks do. Actually, as they also get older, they tend to eat more soups than hard food because of the digestive problems. So the older people in the, uh, among, in the Buddhist temples tend to drink like the bean soup or the rice soup rather than actually eating hard, food, solid food, right? And so for those of us who eat hard, solid food, there are three things that we need. Number one, we need digestive aids. So for example, I take digestimes every time I eat. Because if you look at the, the whole process of digestion, the stomach, the small intestines, the large intestines, the acidity in the stomach is pH 1.5. The, as the alkalinity in the small intestines is around 7, 8.5. We all know what pH is, right? Hello? pH, acidity, alkalinity. So the stomach it's very acidic. It is very acidic because it has to break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates so that the liver secretes the bile to break it down into amino acids and the components of food that the body can absorb. So it's a very toxic environment, very acidic. 
right? So that's why most medication you take cannot go past the stomach because the stomach is very acidic. So as you grow older, the stomach's ability is reduced. That's why you use digestants to create that environment so that it can properly break down the food that you eat. Okay, it's very important that you take digestants. Is that making sense? Right? Number two, you should take probiotics. Why do you take probiotics? You take. Why do you take probiotics? She takes probiotics because you need to balance the bacteria, the good versus the bad. And you have to be taking about two or three kinds of probiotics. In the morning, evening, and night, you need to fluctuate the differences so that you create what we call a balanced flora in your stomach. When children who were born through caesarean, they come out, they always have stomach problems. Because when a child is coming out through the normal passage, it takes the, what the mother's bacterial complexity, which is what then populates the stomach lining. So children who are born through caesarean always have stomach problems. And so you want to give them digestines and probiotics. Number three is what? Prebiotics. What are prebiotics? Fiber. fiber. Very good. Right? Why does the body need fiber? Hello, Americans. No, no, no. Go, go back. It's not to help the waste pass. That's the second reason. No, no. It feeds the bacteria so that they can break the food down. And then it helps you get a number four poo. <laughs> the number four poo. I thought I noticed that. Okay. So if every time you eat, you're not doing this, that's why we have bloating, we have gas, and we cannot sleep well. Right? So let's go back again, just summarize that. So you want to make sure you are doing a, the calorie restriction, right? And then you want to make sure you do the timing. We also have a time restriction. For example, I am now, I eat at 10 a.m. And I try and get dinner finally at 6 p.m. So tonight, I'm not going to eat dinner. I'm just going to have my glucose medical food because it's already past the window during the week when I eat, because I'm running what I call a five times two program, where during the week, I eat between 10 a.m., my first meal, and by 4 p.m., my second meal, or by 6 p.m., right? So I'm fasting So I'm fasting for 12 plus 2. Okay? So that intermittent fasting is really good for this bacterial architecture. That's why fasting is good. Right? Some people are doing... So on the two days when I'm off, I re relax the time restriction and the calorie restriction. You understand that? So this is the new theory on how to really keep your body healthy and your brain clear and smart. You mean that for the first an hour, you really cannot take the supplement? No, you drink water only. Yes, you cannot. You drink water. But if you're hungry, you can take your supplement because you should not be taking supplements here except the supplements that help you sleep. 
So most of your supplements should be here and here. Because the metabolism of the body finishes around when the sun goes down. Okay, so, I have a question. so except there are exceptions. Okay. Yes. Okay. If we are trying to address high blood pressure, we are trying to address other things, we can supplement you even at night because the body needs that to repair the tissue that's damaged. I have a question for you, because on my, uh, I'm in my spare people for su taking supplements. Why did you, it was a first I took the probiotic and the, the other one at night time? Because if you eat late, if you I change, well, well, so that's something we should adapt. Okay. If you change your eating schedule, then we'll change your supplement schedule. But we are giving that schedule because most people eat three meals and that's when they eat. So but if you now say, this is my eating pattern, we can then adjust your supplement schedule. You understand? So but typically we go for people who eat three meals a day and we wanna make sure that people who eat dinner at night uh, have a lot of support before they go to sleep. If not, all night they are turning and tossing and the body is not getting enough rest. Because one of the most fundamental things for, Ill, for chronic illness is number one. It is really, if you're sleeping less than seven hours a night, your body is not working well. That is the number one thing because the body needs at least eight hours every 24 hours for repair, for the repair function, okay? And if you're not sleeping well, your pool cannot get to number four. And then you start pooing twice a day. It just happens naturally as you start doing all of these things and sleeping well, right? And then number two is hydration, right? And then that's number three, right? And then that's number four in terms of priority. And that's number five and then six. All right, so we've been talking, any questions so far? All right, so it is very important that you really understand nutrients and nutrition. So for example, I don't buy food anymore in grocery stores. I buy only in farmer's market. Because in farmer's market, you can actually get meat that comes straight from the farm and research shows that if when you're buying meat, you should buy organ meat. What's organ meat? Americans will not know that. What's organ meat? Kim, I know you don't know. Kenny, what's organ meat? Koreans eat organ meat. Yeah, what is it? He knows organ meat, yes. So it's tongue, liver, heart, kidney, intestines, that's organ meat. Why is organ meat important to us? Because it contains the micronutrients. So if you went to the village, we didn't eat the meat, we ate organ meat. Actually, on Saturday when I went shopping, I bought tongue, right? And I know Koreans barbecue tongue and the barbecue other thing. Most of that cultures have been to don't eat organ meat, except Vietnamese culture that uses the bone to extract the, uh, yeah, to make the soup. We eat all the tongue and the stomach. Okay. Yeah, but I don't see, well, I eat the uh, tripe in the. Uh, I don't eat them, but most women eat. <laughs> so you see, because people eat based on what they like. Rather than what they need. Actually, tongue is very good, me. No, tongue is good, yes. Yes. I can eat the tongue. And liver is very good, too. If you eat a pate, liver so pate. That's not from the beef, though. That's from the chicken. It doesn't matter, but it's okay, liver. Yeah. <laughs> it's organ <all> meat. <laughs> yeah, even in the chicken, you can eat the... Oh, I like the chicken liver. Okay, so is this making sense? So actually, the meat that is more nutritious is the organ meat, not the muscle meat. Okay, so it's very important, and actually, he was telling me that a lot of the, the butcher at uh, the farmer's market was saying that most Americans don't know 
but their organ meat is actually cheaper than the real meat. Of course, because people don't know, right? So if you go to farmer's market and you're buying organ meat, you actually get very good value. Liver, I used to love the liver stew my grandmother used to make. It has this uh, chalky taste, right? And it's really amazing. Is this making sense, guys? All right. So let's talk about sleep. What? Heavy stuff? <laughs> let's talk about the big problem, sleep. Men don't have problems sleeping. So if you're a man and you have problems sleeping, then you have a real big problem. How many men here cannot sleep well? Yeah, you are different. <laughs> Champ, are you like one of those people you fall asleep in two minutes? I fall asleep. Just like that? Like five minutes, yeah. Yeah. But why is it that women cannot fall asleep? No, uh, the reason is because uh, of the nurturing, the nurturing re requirement. After all, we pay the bill. <laughs> Uh, we're not talking about America. Okay. So uh, because of the, uh, the fact that women have children, um, they sleep a lot well until they have children. Right. The minute they have children, their sleep patterns are disrupted significantly. Secondly, they are also always cold. Why are they always cold? Why are women always cold? Generally, even young women, they're always cold. <laughs> what did you say? You said they need a husband. <laughs> no, they are cold because their circulation, their blood circulation, has been diverted for taking care of the baby in the womb. So they have architecturally a different circulatory system. So we have more blood going to our arms, legs, and they have more blood going to their stomach in preparation. Okay, so you find out that their hands and feet are always cold, while ours is generally warm. So let's go back to sleep. So there is that nurturing issue. So if there is a nurturing requirement, Therefore, what controls sleep? The baby. No. <laughs> huh? No, it's hormones. It's hormones. That is why the sleep actually gets worse once the, their period stops, once the monthly cycle stops. Right? So God created this very complex engine. When women are born, they are given a certain number of eggs. When they run out of those eggs, they go into menopause. In some cultures, they used to burn them because they are witches. Right? They become very mean and terrible, so they will put them on a stake and burn them off. Right? <laughs> in the old days, yes, they burn them after they are no longer productive. That's why in most cultures, once a woman passes this stage, they're considered old, right? Most cultures, that's how they do it. Men were created very differently. There is no limit to the amount of sperm. That's why the men can have babies even when they're 90 years old, right? Why is that? Don't give me some flip American answers. Why is that? Uh, well, no. No, 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 no. No, he's right. He's on the right path. That is it. Okay, okay. Let him explain that again. That's the right answer. Explain that. So, like, basically, the 
woman wants the most successful man because that's going to give her, her children the best chance of being the most successful. Do you hear that, guys? I know that American culture doesn't understand that. That's the reason. So the older men tend to produce the stronger children. So you tend to find out that if the man is 50 and the wife is 20, mm -hmm. this combination is very powerful. Okay, guys, relax. It's very powerful because she's walking into a Bentley home, a five-bedroom home with Bentley and maid and everything, and all she has to do with her fresh eggs is to produce babies. And so the children are being brought into a very powerful, strong environment for survival. That is really how the architecture was. If you go to the old culture, the old men are always marrying young women. Second time. Well. <laughs> Second time, yes. Uh, because now, these women are the ones taking care of the babies, right? They are retired. Yes. So they are retired, and then they take care of the family. OK, is that making sense, guys? So don't go say that. Uh, don't go sue me and say I'm proposing uh, <laughs> that we retire all the women, right? So this is very important because um, when you have this stability, women sleep better. So the reason why in the modern culture women don't sleep is exactly what she was saying. They have gone into this unstable culture called love where he's 20, she's 20, and this is really chaotic for the woman, right? Because she has to watch him fall and rise and fall and rise, and that is caused too much trauma, right? In this architecture, he's got it made. She's just riding, and he's very confident now. So he can add more, right? And get a lot more concubines, <laughs> right? So like my grandfather had like uh, 42 children with 10 wives, right? So, but he had a big compound, right? Because in my culture, you didn't let your child marry a poor man. So the only the successful men could marry the women because then you wanted your children to have a good life. You don't, you don't, there was no love because love doesn't pay bills, right? It's bullshit. So you marry only the people who can actually take care of the children. That was the old culture. And in some old cultures now you still see, it, it still happens today. That's why naturally, even though women would not say they are more attracted to successful men. Right? Even ugly men like Trump. <laughs> but do you understand? So women are naturally, and it's not because they like money. It's because, no. It's because of the security that it creates and that environment of stability. Then they can sleep. Right? They don't have to worry about what are we going to eat tomorrow? Are we going to pay the rent tomorrow? Because men don't care whether the rent is paid or not. They fall asleep. But the woman worries about those things a lot. So that's why the women tend to prefer successful. Even though they say they are looking for good-looking men, that's bullshit. They really want a rich man. Once you're rich, they don't care whether you're good-looking. Right? So people keep saying, why is Melania doing with Trump? And she's like, don't you get it? There's a lot of money here. Who's going to give me a penthouse in Trump Tower? How many guys can stand up to that shit, right? And she can spend whatever she wants to spend on anything she wants to spend, right? Isn't that the ideal life? So that's the big issue around sleep. Because sleep is also connected to number four, stress, right? And you know the biggest stress, which is our mental stress, is really financial. 
that's the even though we all pretend like that's not the stress it's the biggest reason of divorce right if you marry somebody who is not performing right <laughs> right if the guy cannot pay rent he cannot assure the family he cannot go on vacation so that she can be arrogant to her friend. Oh, we're just going on a cruise. Oh, we're going to Italy. Oh, we're, right? Women love to tell their friends that shit. You know, men don't really want to go anywhere. They are fine where they are. <laughs> the women have to go to these places so they can show off to their friends, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. So, yeah, pictures. But... So this is not a critique. This is just how women are and how men are different and how it causes stress and lack of sleep, right? We have some other biological reasons about stress, like inflammation, like sleep, like uh, sugar, metabolism. But the real driver for stress is the emotional stress that comes from the lack of security. So you would have thought that Marriages of love will be more secure and long-lasting than marriages, arranged marriages. But arranged marriages are more successful. The data is out there very clear. And the reason is stress. In love marriages, you are loving a loser. Right? <laughs> In arranged marriages, they are giving you to a family that they know can deliver. Right? So you see in American culture, a lot of women marry people who are just drinking. They met in a club, right? That's what he's going to do the rest of his life, smoking and drinking. And then they all complain, oh, I had two babies with him and he couldn't pay the rent. And people are like, well, you were stupid, right? But your parents were trying to get you to marry the right person and couldn't. Any questions on that? So this issue of stress is that the way men perceive stress and the way women perceive stress creates this real conflict, right? And so women are very comfortable in an environment where they can spend whatever they want to spend without question. They're very comfortable in that environment. Then there's no stress. But if the man is not making enough money, that causes a lot of stress, right? Because there's not constraint on how much they want to spend. So like Kim, they get divorced so they can spend their money anyhow they want, right? So women tend to choose that pathway. So let's talk about hydration. Any questions so far? So do you see why all these things make us age and get sick? Because none of us has a perfect life. Married or unmarried. Everyone is stressed, right? So let's talk about hydration. So we need to be drinking minimum eight glasses of water a day. Why do Americans not like drinking glasses of water? I say Americans because even people who came, immigrants who came from other cultures like my children, they learn the bad habit of drinking soda. So in Europe, most Europeans drink sparkling water. Because sparkling water is actually very good for digestion, right? Because that carbonic acid in it goes in and actually helps create bubbles and helps with digestion itself. So that's why a lot of Europeans will serve sparkling water. It's actually good for you. And actually, sparkling water tastes different from normal water, right? But Americans don't like to drink water because they are used to drinking things that are sweet, right? So you find out that this issue of hydration, most Americans are dehydrated. Most Americans are dehydrated. There are very few people, well, even when we run the, t the test, and you will see from your, may I see yours? No, please. All right. Is it okay if I talk about your numbers openly? Mm -hmm. You and I need to talk after. Let me just talk about your hydration numbers. 
So if we look at your body water, oh yeah, he's actually very good. So if you look at the body water level here, it should be 93. I mean, you have 93. It should be between 80 and 98. So the amount of body water. And then we look at the ratio of intracellular water and extracellular water. It's very good. So you have more water inside your cell than outside. So it looks like you drink water enough. Yeah, I drink soda sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You drink soda? Just once in a while. Like once every week? I want to understand the while. Once every week? Once a day. Once or twice. Once or twice. Okay, once a day? Like once every three days? Okay. All right. So, but during the day, how much water do you drink? Okay, so so do you know why most people don't drink water? No. Uh, for women, why do women not like drinking water? Yeah, huh? yeah, they don't like to pee. Right, because especially in, in, in the West, Southern California where there's traffic, no woman wants to want to pee and she's caught up in traffic. Right, because there you are there squeezing your, right? Like, oh, wow. Even when you see the bathroom, it's like, am I going to make it? Right? So nobody wants to be under that condition. So it makes people not want to drink water. Right? For men, they just forget. They don't remember to drink water, except they are eating or they want to eat or something like that. Right? Um, yeah, let me talk to you privately later about your results. Okay. So hydration is very important, and it is good that you actually drink water during the waking hours, that you drink a glass every hour. That is really the best way to look at it. And for me, when I wake up in the morning, even though I'm not eating, I typically would drink about three or four glasses of water when I wake up. And actually at night, I wake up about once to go pee, and I actually have a glass of water with lemon, right? That's what they recommend, that you always have a glass of water by your bedside with lemon. First thing in the morning, because it helps with washing out, and also at night, have a bottle or a glass of water with lemon. So I buy a lot of lemons. That's the most expensive thing I buy from the farmer's market because I'll buy about 10 or 20 lemons. They're very expensive, the organic ones. But and lemon at night, it gives you a vitamin C, you can't sleep? No, that's not true. Serious? No, it's not, no. You should, it's very good in cleansing everything. Detox. Yes, it helps with your detox, especially your metal detox, mm -hmm. okay? So it's very good that you always, actually, every time I'm home, I'm drinking water, I'm drinking with lemon. Yeah, so I'm squeezing. I use about two lemons a day. So lem wh what are we going to say? Um, usually I'm not into salty water, so it tastes like soda. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, because actually when you add lemon to water, it really tastes good. It changes the taste. Yeah, it really, I love the taste of having oh, lemon. No, I know why now my sister's school is better because she drinks lemon water for 10 years. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, it's she very good for you. lemon into the bottle of water. Yes. She, she Yes, it's, very, it's a very good practice for you to start having. I do it now. When I'm at home, every glass of water I drink, I'm squeezing lemon into it. Okay, it's very, very good for you. Yes, and it helps you detox and your whole system, right? So let's talk about detox. Why do we need to detox? And how often should we detox? Kenny, have you ever detoxed? Do you understand detox? Not really. Okay. So, um, so like this Kowei machine, mm -hmm. it's a very important machine for me because I have it all the offices. So it cleans the air. Because see all of those cars passing? If we go to white, white, clean that window outside, mm -hmm. you see that black dust. That's what we're all breathing. And when all of that goes in, 
a lot of that black dust is the output of petroleum products and they're all carcinogenic and those products they go and they sit inside your organs and that's what really ultimately causes cancer you understand because they are strange objects the cell doesn't know what to do with it and it then makes the cell to start behaving irrationally and start dividing and that's what carcinogenesis is you understand so detoxing we have metal we have sulfur detox and metal detox detox is a very very dangerous process because when it releases the toxins inside your body, it can make you really very sick. So you have to have nutrients that bind with it so that it can excrete it properly. So I take Metalloclear every day. And then you should also detox every three months. Toxicity is one of the biggest challenges in healthcare. So if you eat in the restaurant all the time, the, you don't know the quality of water they're using to cook, right? So that's why they say when you travel, you must only drink purified water and only eat boiling food, right? Because even if you eat salad in another country, even if the salad, there's nothing wrong with it, the bacteria in the salad is foreign to your stomach, it's gonna cause you stomach problems because we have bacteria inside of us all the time, when you change that balance, except you're taking the digestimes, the probiotic and the prebiotics that I was talking about, then that will normalize the bacteria content from food, right? So even when you buy carrots or anything, you must wash them in vinegar and water. Because most carrots, I know most of you don't know, grows in compost. What is in compost? Shit. Shit. <laughs> right? So many people just pick the carrot and start eating. <laughs> yes, you really need to wash it very well. And then even the apples, that's why you have to clean the surface because they've been sprayed with chemicals right. so that they don't go bad, yeah. right? So you need to wash them with vinegar so you can. So toxicity is one of our biggest challenges in trying to stay healthy, OK? The last one is exercise. Ken is like, what? How many things are we? So what we do here, I'm not going to talk about exercise because you all know about exercise. Here in the company every morning, as a group, we all stretch. Uh, actually, stretching is the most important exercise. Why is stretching the most important exercise? Your blood, your blood circulation. Yes, circulation and toxicity, right? That's why when you go for massage, massages are very good for you because it releases the toxicity. You understand? So detoxing, it, it allows blood to flow all the angles and brings everything out for excretion, okay? So, th there is a concept that we have designed here called intelligent lifestyle design. So, why do I call it intelligent lifestyle design? Because most people's lives are not designed. Your kitchen is designed, right? How many people's lifestyle is designed? For example, how often do you exercise? There's a certain part in the lifestyle is designed because of health. I know, I know. Everything. So if you look at the seven lifestyles, but it needs to be designed because there's one thing that the body loves. It loves regularity and it loves consistency. Do you see the two things there? It likes that you do things often at the same time. It's like sleep. It likes for you to go to bed at a regular time, right? If it's 8.30, 9.30, it likes regularity. And it also likes consistency. 
You understand? So how do we bring that into design? So if we look at our design variables, now I'm getting technical, right? We are looking at consistency. And we're looking at, what was the other word? Regularity. Regularity. Right? So whether we take water, right? I'm going to add something else on top, which is quality. Right? So I begin to have my design attributes. So now when I take water or hydration, I want to say how I'm going to make that consistent. Right? Because most times when your body aches, it's because you're dehydrated. That's why even when you're sleeping, the body, if you notice your pee in the morning and your pee during the day, the day it's very different. So why is the pee in the morning very different from the pee during the day? No, because you don't have enough water. So it's very acidic. The pee has a stronger smell in the morning than it has during the day because you're dehydrated. So that's why it's good to drink water even at night. Whenever you wake up at night, if you drink water, you go back to bed faster because that's really why you're waking up. The body is dehydrated. Or you have a headache or something, it's a sign of dehydration, right? So if we take each of the attributes, we can now start building a kind of design around it. So this strategy is what we call a proactive lifestyle design. Right? But most people are already in distress. Remember that first diagram I showed you? Most people are not in vitality. They are not normal. How do we know that, Grace? How do we know that, Grace? How do we know that most people are not in vitality and normal? Because their clinical biomarkers are yellow and red. Is there anybody here whose biomarkers are all green? Exactly. So most people are in distress and disorder. So they also need a reactive strategy. What's a reactive strategy? So you need both. We've been talking about lifestyle design here, right? All those things you're talking. But you need a reactive strategy to pull you here. A proactive strategy is when you're here, you want to maintain it. A reactive strategy is to bring you back here. So you have to do the two so that you're arriving at this point, right? That's where the tough battle is, the reactive strategy, right? Because you want to go back to vitality, right? And so that's why we recommend a 24-month program. So I'm going to talk about that. We're almost running out of time. So somebody like Kim is already on that program. And the big question Kim keeps asking is, when? When? <laughs> when do all my biomarkers come to green? Even when all the biomarkers come to green, we cannot stop. Because when you are in distress or disorder, two things are already wrong. One, your clinical biomarkers are in yellow or red. And number two, your genes have changed. We call that epigenetics. Your genes have changed. Like if you used to smoke or used to eat a lot or used to eat a lot of sugar, your genes have already changed. So even when your biomarkers come back, we still have to change your genes back. Because if you eat a lot of sugar, 
your genes have switched on and off for a sugar environment. Yes. How do you change my diet? Well, that's the challenge. Some people, it might never happen. And that is really the tough thing. So we use a lot of supplements for that. And so what we do is that we follow our strategy by looking at what we call the six physiological systems in the body, right? Number one is the GI. Number two is the immune system. Number three is the cardiometabolic. Number four is the stress. Number five is the what? Which one am I missing? Number six is the hormone. Uh, no. Yeah, the muscular skeletal system. Okay? So these six things need to be repaired for us to switch the genes back to normal. Okay? So... And this is the most important system to fix. Because like she was saying, this is the source of inflammation that affects immunity. So a patient is coming tomorrow in our workshop that has MS. MS is a neurogenerative disease. And it actually arrives from inflammation. Alzheimer's, autism, they are all neurogenerative diseases and they all are sourced from inflammation. Because the damage of inflammation, what we call chronic inflammation, there are two kinds of inflammation, right? One is acute. The second one is chronic. So I'll show you a diagram. Acute inflammation is like that. It's our normal fight or flight. For champs, it's normally fight. Okay, that's our normal response. They attack you, you fight, right? So adrenaline is released. That's normal reaction. Chronic inflammation, it goes up and it stays there. This is the cause of illness. So most of us have chronic inflammation. And so SPM helps to bring that down. But the problem long term with SPM is that it cannot solve these inflammations that keep persisting. Right? So it can modulate it, but if the inflammation persists. So that's why uh, tomorrow we're going to focus on this stuff. So if you want to come and listen to that tomorrow. Any questions? Kenny, give us some feedback. Yeah, quality, yeah. You're, you're right. And so if, if you're someone, like I have a friend, a magician, he sleeps, uh, she sleeps in the morning, starting six in the morning. He's going to get sick. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If they sleep eight hours, but in the wrong time, they will get sick. Because yes. you need to sleep uh -huh. when the sun is down. If you sleep during, that's why shift workers they all develop cardiometabolic diseases. Yes, if, 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 someone starts a gastric question, uh, if you can do it for some time, it's okay. Like we all did it in university, mm -hmm. right, where we study all night, but for a short time. But if you have a shift job, the research is out, very clear. Those people have almost double incidence of cardiometabolic illnesses. And it gets worse. Oh, yes, it gets worse. Yeah, so when people say I'm a night person or I'm a day person, it's all bullshit. We need to sleep when the sun goes down. Mm -hmm. Then people ask the question, what about the people in Alaska? In winter, 
they spend most of the time sleeping. That's what the animals do. They hibernate in winter. The animals are not stupid. They, they almost go into a comatose state, and they stay in that during all winter, and then when the sun comes, they wake up. So unless the summer has a connection to the environment, that the, the All of us have to have a connection to the environment. Then we, we're, not, we're not really sure. This, uh, my health is getting better or getting worse. You have to be connected. To, yeah, you have no choice. That's why the sun and all of that, we're connected. So you have to be connected. Does that making sense? Is that clear? All the research is very clear. If you're a shift worker, I know like musicians, they work all night, or like people who work in bars. If the hospital, the races, oh, that's the why they're all sick. Yeah, they have high incidence of aneurysm. They're all sick. What? She said, what about you? I said it's daytime. Me? Oh, yeah, no, okay, no, yeah. No, he works daughter, daytime. She, she has a great yeah. Health. Well, but so if you do it for a short time, it's okay. But that if you go to the hospital, look at all the nurses across the street here. They're all overweight, and they're all sick, and they're all depressed, and they're all on medication. And high incidence of aneurysm and Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Nurses, really bad profession because of that. You understand? <laughs> if it, well, even doctors. Yeah, doctors. That's why Dr. Walsh. He feels that the cancer came because he was always, babies always come at 4 a.m. So he was always in the hospital at 2 a.m. most of his life being a pediatrician. So that lack of sleep, there's a price to pay. He's look, a very healthy guy, get brain cancer. So sleep and those, the, what we're talking about, consistency, regularity, and quality are really very important things. So it's better for you to eat good quality food in a small amount regularly than to go to McDonald's and eat things that you don't know what they are, right? Because even the fries in McDonald's, we don't know what it is inside. They're not real fries. You know that, right? There is no real potato. So what is it? Somebody educate me. But do you see how many people are feeding that to their children? It's a mashed potato. It is not. <laughs> it's not potato. Even the meat in McDonald's in the burger, what is it? It's 70% of milk. And the rest is milk. I mean, we don't even know. And so people sit there eating it when they don't know. Because you could ha make your own burger at home where you get the meat, you would grill. Right? You could actually create your own stuff from home. Then you have the quality. Burgers are not bad for you. It's just eating burgers that you don't know what's inside. Do you see the point? Because a lot of people are making like, oh, that's bad, that's bad. No, that's not the point. It's that if you don't prepare well, I mean, even the fries, the oil they use to fry the potatoes, it's very, very dangerous for you. Right? Is that making sense? So when I talk about an intelligent lifestyle design, you need to take those seven things and create your own daily routine that's consistent, regular, and of good quality. Habits. Yeah, so you, that, that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, how you build those habits. Okay, and what is the process for building those habits so that you can attain what we call purpose. So tomorrow we're going to talk about the physiological things and then we're going to talk about how we build habits so that we can achieve our goals. Because you cannot delete a bad habit. Like if you like drinking soda, the best way to stop drinking soda is to start drinking carbonated water. Because it still gives you that feeling of carbonation, but there's no sugar. Yeah. Yeah. So you can also say, I'm going to stop drinking Coke. That's bullshit. He has tried and failed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? It's replacement. Yeah, you have to replace the habit. And that's only the best strategy you have. Right? And everything about being healthy is very tough. Because if you notice, we all know this, right? Who here, we all love to be lazy. Right? Who, t who here doesn't love to be lazy? She's going to say she doesn't love to be lazy. 
Yeah, but on Saturday, she's crawling in bed like, oh, this is so good, right? We all love to sleep in, right? And so to be healthy is really tough. You know, like this morning, I went to play tennis at 6. I was at the tennis court at 6 a.m., and my coach didn't show up. So I had to go into the gym, right? But can you imagine being at the tennis court at 6 a.m.? How many of you were awake? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What were you doing? You didn't sleep? Oh, Vincent was watching whether I'm going to send a message. <laughs> Vincent is awake, alert, waiting. Oh, he's awake. Let me see. Is he going to send me a message? Does he want me to do anything? Oh, I did it. Oh, he smokes just like. <laughs> if you notice, look at your that blood pressure. Okay, so she also uh, is still smoking, but we have struggled to bring her blood pressure down. Yours is also getting high. At least, did are you gonna do it now? Then let's see. Yeah, you understand. So if you're smoking and you don't detox, it shows in your blood pressure. So if you detox and you start, then your blood pressure begins to come down. Okay, it's very important, guys, because blood pressure is the strongest indicator that something is very wrong. Okay, it's very, very wrong. So your number is getting really close to, are you on medication? Wow, that's not good. Because for men, blood pressure is the biggest issue with erectile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> Since I mentioned that Vincent has been losing weight, working hard, because he- has he, good score. His score is good. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, but hold on. You know, I was telling you that the men in the village, they go having babies till 90. In America, by 50, the men are all dead. Right, my friend? His clinic is an erectile dysfunction clinic in uh, Rancho Cucamonga. We're going to take that clinic over, so... And hormone replacement, and testosterone, yes, yes, exactly. It's all past of ED. It's, all it's your hormone levels and everything. So any other question? How was this? We have some refreshments. So thank you for coming. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow, okay? Hopefully.